Our first presenter is uh, Brother Richard Bennett. Dr. Bennett is uh, speaking today on Pentecostals and Mormons in Asia. He was born and raised in Canada. He will probably mention that during the presentation at some point, just to let him, just to let us know, uh, in Ontario and Sudbury. Um, his master's and bachelor's are here from Brigham Young University, his PhD from Wayne State, which is in Michigan. From 1978 to 1997, he was chair of the Department of Archives and Manuscripts at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. He joined the BYU faculty in 1997. He's currently the chair and my boss. Um, so he can go as long as he wants. Actually, no. He <laughs> um, and uh, that, that's the Church History and Doctrine Department here at Brigham Young University. He's the author of six books. He's published over 50 articles on church history and archival management. He's married to the former Patricia Dyer, who's sitting beside him on the front row. They are the father of five children and 20 grandchildren. Turn it over to Brother Bennett. Thank you, Ken. It won't be on Asia. It'll be on Africa. An obscure moment in Mormon Pentecostal relations occurred back in March 2002 in Nacogdoches, Texas, when Bishop Paul H. Risk of the Nacogdoches Ward of the Longview Stake wondered what to do with their church steeple, made surplus by recent renovations to their meeting house. His high priest group leader suggested that a tiny church outside his community of Timpson might be able to use it, and thereupon contacted Pastor Leroy Bowley of the Springs of Living Water Pentecostal Church. It just so happened that the Mormon steeple was a perfect fit for the pitch on the roof of Pastor Bowley's church. He and members of his congregation of 75 were ecstatic about the prospect. Today, while we look at a few statistics on Pentecostal and Mormon growth, not in Texas, but in faraway Africa, my purpose is to explore historical and theological commonalities between our two great religious traditions and attempt to erect a new steeple of understanding and dialogue between us. Until recently, the very word Pentecostal, as did the word Mormonism, had a negative connotation to many. As late as 1995, one Greek Orthodox archbishop labeled both as non-Christian religions. In the words of Professor Mel Robick of Fuller Theological Seminary, and one of the foremost authorities on the topic, classical Christianity has often viewed Pentecostalism as being theologically misguided, psychologically unbalanced, sociologically inconsequential, ecclesiologically radical, existentially fanatical, and in some cases as indisputably demonic. There are so many different waves and wonders of Pentecostalism in the world today that to identify and to differentiate each one is an insuperable task. There are the Assemblies of God, the Apostolic Churches, the Full Gospel and Four Square Churches, the Black Holiness and Oneness Pentecostals, the Charismatics and the Neo-Charismatics, the Restorationists and the Independents, all wrapped up together in what David Barrett has called the Renewalists, Yet despite its worldwide diversity and its incredible ability to adapt to new surroundings and to adopt local cultural expressions, what unites and characterizes the Pentecostal movement into a single community of believers is, to cite Robick once again, the profundity of interaction between the Holy Spirit of God and the individual. Indeed, the moments of existential encounter with the Holy Spirit may be the one distinctive that all Pentecostals acknowledge together. And in that moment, they are profoundly, irretrievably transformed. Whether such spiritual encounters take the form of healings, prophecies, exorcisms, testimonies, or above all, speaking in tongues, they all take the scriptural authority and precedence from the biblical account of the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost appeared in cloven tongues of fire to Peter and to the other apostles. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues of fire, and sat upon each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as a spirit gave them utterance. 
After a long, dark night of protracted spiritual decadence, modern Pentecostalism broke forth in the early 20th century in an, out in an outcrop of simultaneous revivals of the Holy Spirit in India, Korea, Latin America, and the United States. Most scholars, however, point to the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles in 1906 to 1909 under the direction of the African-American preacher William Joseph Seymour as a spiritual spark that soon flamed a worldwide movement that burns brightly to the present day. So many women and men experience the joyful ecstasy of speaking in tongues and receiving other spirit manifestations that thousands flock to the little warehouse on 312 Azusa Street and to what Harvey Cox in his book Fire from Heaven has called, quote, a genuinely American spiritual revolution, if ever there was one. Black, poor, and as relatively illiterate as he was spiritually sensitive and biblically educated, Pastor Seymour and followers like Frank Bartleman, Eleanor Patrick, and Thomas Barrett gave vision to the gospel of inclusion of black and white, bond and free, male and female, for all are alike unto God. <clears throat> From the outset then, color was washed away by the blood. Women were encouraged to preach and to lead, and all were invited to sacrifice everything to spread the gospel to the four parts of the earth. Initially an urban phenomenon that met resistance and persecution at every turn, Pentecostalism soon spread to other American cities and by 1920 to over 40 countries. While it's true that the experience of God has absolute primacy over dogma and doctrine, Pentecostalism is not bereft of a sturdy theology. For much of the first half of the 20th century, it exhibited a strong primitivist restorationist impulse a belief in what they call the latter reign, R-A-I-N, in which biblical truths and manifestations of God's love and faith were once again being showered down upon the earth. With it came a strong millennial sensibility and a mood of joyful expectation of Christ's second coming. <clears throat> it also claimed a firm belief in the Trinity, the primacy of the Holy Bible, the need for a born-again experience and a continued holiness and sanctification from sin, and a shunning of worldly gratifications, indeed a deep sense of the sacred. More recently, what has increasingly set it apart is the let go and let God emphasis on not just experiencing the divine in the free manifestations of the Holy Ghost, but more to the point, experiencing a life-changing transformation authored by the free will gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Excuse me. For some Pentecostals, unlike their evangelical cousins in faith, such a manifestation, if not a prerequisite or precondition to salvation, is a joyful, essential Bible evidence or manifestation of the grace of Christ, for he shall bring all things to your remembrance and testify of me. With a strong commitment to go ye therefore and teach all nations, Pentecostalism reached Africa's shores early in the 20th century, but made its first significant inroads just prior to World War I with the great native evangelist William Wade Harris, the formidable Liberian prophet of the Ivory Coast, who between 1910 and 1914 with a Bible in one hand and a bamboo cross on another baptized over 100,000 converts in the Ivory Coast and West Ghana, and carried out what Adrian Hastings has described as the, quote, most remarkable single evangelical campaign Africa has ever witnessed. Isaiah Shambe, the magnetic, the magnetic South African Zulu he healer and hymn writer, and Moses Oromole of Nigeria followed in Harris's footsteps and founded churches and mass followings that laid a Pentecostal foundation others later built upon. Such native African preachers with their emphasis on healings, prophecies, and protection from evil, witchcraft, and sorceries made inroads into tribal Africa that the long-established European Christian churches had failed to accomplish. 
If a bit extreme for some Western missionaries, these early native preachers nevertheless plowed the ground for the later more populist Zionist movement that drew converts from both Christians and non-Christians alike and emphasized local African leadership. Pentecostalism's early disengagement from Western-style institutional Christianity and its assimilation into native-led black African evangelization came at a most fortuitous moment. The so-called Ethiopian movement of the late 40s and 1950s was a West African Christian protest against white domination in the mission churches, or in Alan Anderson's words, a genuine aversion to white man's Christianity. And as Jehu Hansels has observed, it combined religious protest, racial identity, rejection of European domination, and a vision for the evangelization of Africa by Africans, and empowered the phenomenal rise of the independent church movement and of the African initiated churches. Such a pro-black African sentiment rose as a creative response to the breakdown of traditional African society and inspired a resistance to such social injustices as South African apartheid and other malignancies of colonial rule. In the 1970s, partly as a reaction to the bureaucratization process and established Christian churches and their unwillingness to adapt to African cultural mores, new independent Pentecostal and charismatic churches exploded in numbers all over sub-Saharan sub Africa. Again, as Alan Anderson contends, young charismatic leaders emerged with significant followers and have proven immensely popular. Pentecostalism's growth in Africa staggers the imagination. In 1910, the number of evangelists, the collective term for the wide variety of Pentecostals, stood at 1.1 million. A century later, it had multiplied to 162 million, 664,000, with over 25,000 converts joining per day in the year 2012. It is projected that by 2025, at its present rate of growth, Pentecostalism will count as its own 227 million Africans, mostly south of the Sahara and away from the Muslim-dominated North Africa, a future mission field. The Pentecostalization of Africa has in turn led to the exportation of African Christianity into those very nations that once sent missionaries to Africa and it's revitalizing Protestant and Catholic churches in Europe and around the world. Of all the many reasons accounting for such growth, in addition to the spirit manifestations already alluded to, we have time to mention but one more. And the key word here is indigenization. Shunning hierarchy or an institutional bureaucracy, the movement has exploded like shattered glass into pieces setting up new altars, as Ogwu Kalu has put it, and been captured by and assimilated and translated into the very soul of Africa. Its power to heal, to overpower evil spirits, and its aptitude for adopting the language, the music, the cultural artifacts, the religious tropes, even the demigods, and race of the setting in which he lives, has, in Harvey Cox's view, made it so successfully relevant. And as Bishop Desmond Tutu has put it, the white man's largely cerebral religion was hardly touching the depths of the African soul. He was being given answers, and often splendid answers, to questions Africa had never asked. <laughs> Pentecostalism's individualized spiritual spirituality replaced what it perceived as calcified norms of institutional religion that many in Africa have come to distrust as lacking in the operations of the Holy Spirit. The present African-led protest against gay marriage and ordination from a continent that has lost millions to AIDS is but one example of such opposition, a schism within the Anglican community that threatens to tear that church apart. Mormonism, in turn, is a relative latecomer to black Africa, 
While it's true that Mormon missionaries first came to South Africa in 1853 and then intermittently thereafter, the total Mormon membership in the entire continent as of 1978 numbered only 7,000. Far less than the number of Mormons in Idaho Falls. That figure in all likelihood would have remained stagnant had it not been for President Spencer W. Kimball's revelatory announcement in September 1978 lifting the long-established policy that had banned black Africans for so long from receiving the priesthood. As Alexander B. Morrison of the 70 later commented, this sudden policy reversal initiated <clears throat> a new day in African Mormon history. Surely, 1978 marked a turning point in Mormon missionary success. Since that time, the number of Mormons has grown from 7,700 to 390,000, with the largest concentrations of Latter-day Saints in Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, Congo, and Zimbabwe. Today, the church is established in at least 31 countries. The first black African stake or diocese was established in 1988 in Abba, Nigeria. Today, there are over 77 stakes or dioceses. The Book of Mormon has been translated into many African languages, and Mormon temples are in operation in Johannesburg, South Africa, Abba, Nigeria, and Accra, Ghana. The question that some leading academicians ask, however, is whether such growth has come because of or despite Mormonism's hierarchical, heavily institutionalized, very corporate-style form of ecclesiastical governance and rigidly controlled missionary operations reminiscent of the 19th century London Missionary Society. Christianity scholar Philip Jenkins, in an article published in the Journal of Mormon History just five years ago, while noting Mormon growth on the continent since 78, argued that the rising tide has lifted all boats, in the sense that almost every Christian religion has experienced dramatic African growth in the 20th century. He went on to show how much weaker Latter-day Saint growth has been when compared to that of other churches and concluded that Quote, the LDS tradition has not been particularly successful in Africa. Among the many reasons he gave were Mormonism's late start and the absence of a deep historical presence and structure, a lingering African resentment against the church's long-established policy of priesthood exclusion, its sense of American foreignness, a firm resistance to indige indigenization, and its strikingly few, quote, quote, concessions to local tastes or customs, and its fervent theology of strict sectarianism that makes interfaith cooperation difficult and which runs counter to powerful trends in African religion. To such a list, one might add the following, the emphasis on individuality and political conservatism in a land that prizes tribal living and communal cooperation, a resistance to change in music patterns and expressions, a policy of growth from centers of strength, strength which, while defensible and understandable, has kept the LDS faith from establishing a strong rural presence, and a not-so-subtle effort to tie gospel truths to American cultural values and expressions. It is not for me, a mere historian, to decree church policy or doctrine. However, as an observer, I can point to reasons why Mormonism may be poised to make greater African inro inroads than ever before. First, Mormon indigenization is not a contradiction in terms. The 1978 lifting of the priesthood exclusion was a signal that it can and will accommodate to local conditions. Furthermore, the church's recent website pronouncement on race and the priesthood is the strongest statement yet made disavowing previous justifications for such exclusionary policies, no matter who said them or when. It is a powerfully liberating statement that removes layers of misunderstanding on race and captures and resuscitates the original Mormon restoration message that God is no respecter of persons, no matter what nation or continent, and that every man might speak in the name of God the Lord. It points to a cultural paradigm shift in Mormon thinking towards its past and its theology and may have enormous ramifications to the missionary emphasis in the future. Second, the lay leadership in Africa at the local level is overwhelmingly black African and maturing, lacking a professional clergy 
Mormonism thrives at the local level because its lay leaders take ownership and responsibility for its manage management and growth. More and more of its full-time African missionaries are black Africans who speak the languages and the cultures of their continent. Third, as with Pentecostalism's emphasis on women, the LDS Church is giving greater voice to women leaders. It's in local governing councils, in appointing international women to church boards, and in calling more female missionaries. Of the 85,000 full-time missionaries worldwide today, approximately 25 to 30 percent are female, compared to half that percentage two years ago. Fourth, as the LDS Church signals its intent not only to proselytize and to take people out of their communities into a Mormon culture, but also to stay and work hard at improving, upgrading, and enriching all aspects of local living, as it did so famously well in the Ethiopian famine relief of the late 1980s. It will only attract more positive recognition. Its efforts, when combined with other humanitarian relief efforts at reducing poverty and abolishing illiteracy, will continue to be well received. Finally, may I signal to our Pentecostal friends that there may be more that unites us than divides us. Let us count the ways. Both traditions have been unjustly maligned, persecuted, and misunderstood. Both share an American origin, entertain a strong missionary commitment, a strong strain of Christian primitivism and restorationism, and an adherence to the ancient apostolic faith and apostolic office are common to both. Both stress a holy, sanctified way of living and are anxious to preserve and improve family values against the onslaught of modern secularism. And like many Pentecostals, Latter-day Saints, as their name implies, believe in the rapidly coming millennial day and Christ's second coming, an all too unpopular view in this highly secularized, supposedly post-Christian era. And the last great common denominator between us, the one that needs further development and expression and amplification is the role of the Holy Spirit. Well known in Pentecostalism, belief in spirit-led utterance, but not so well known as Mormonism's similar belief in and expressed so well in its seventh article of faith. We too, if I can say that, believe in the gift of tongues. Prophecy, revelation, visions, healings, interpretation of tongues, and so forth. The very first chapters of the Book of Mormon speak of Lehi, a visionary man who was overcome by the Spirit and was carried away in a vision. And of his son Nephi being led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which he should do. More than a matter of indigenization or importation, we share in the measure of the miraculous. Through the visitation of the Spirit of the Lord, and in Mormonism, the imparting of the gift of the Holy Ghost. More akin to our Pentecostal friends than our evangelical associates, Mormonism would argue that without such an endowment, sanctification and salvation are unattainable. For as the Apostle Paul declared, for our gospel came not unto you in and only, but also in power, in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Perhaps then we can work together in tearing down fences of misunderstanding and building new steeples of communication and cooperation. Thank you. <laughs>